Colorado is using a small fraction of its testing capabilities for coronavirus. We'll look at why doctors want more. And we still can't get a clear answer about the cost to Coloradans who will go in to be tested. We need to get past this idea of waiting for Colorado's first confirmed case of COVID-19. It's not smart. A ballot issue has a county elections clerk working on the honor system. Joe Biden did not campaign in Colorado, but two pieces of paperwork give him an edge on Super Tuesday tonight. And the lessons that were learned a century ago when flu was sweeping the world and one town in Colorado shut out the outside. Next. It is inevitable Coloradans will be heading to health care providers for testing for COVID-19, the coronavirus. The state is covering the costs of the tests, which are not happening very often now, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But we've been unable to get a clear answer from the state on whether Colorado is going to follow New York's lead in directing insurers not to charge people for ER visits, urgent care stops, or doctor's office visits while they're getting tested for coronavirus. When we asked Democratic Governor Jared Polis directly about New York's plan, he had more to say about our lab. The capacity for the 160 day is new. Uh, up until uh, that was in place at the state lab, uh, we had conducted roughly two dozen tests. Um, and and th those were those were not we were not able to do those in house in our lab. Now we have that capacity. We will continue to ask the Polis administration about an answer to the issue of costs when you go in to get tested. We know that folks are concerned about that. So our state does not have a confirmed case of COVID-19 right now. But the fact is, we've not been testing for it widely. Colorado is using just a fraction of our testing capability. The state says its lab in Denver's Lowry neighborhood can handle 160 tests a day. As of this afternoon, it had done 23 tests since Friday. That's less than 5% of what the state's capable of doing right now. And this has been a nationwide issue. Doctors across America have been clamoring for more testing. That would allow them to detect cases earlier, to flag some of the majority of coronavirus cases that are going to be mild, not just the emergency cases. Then that way, they can trace contacts and they can alert vulnerable people who may have been exposed. State health leaders tell our Nine Wants to Know team that they're hoping to be near testing capacity by the end of the week. Let's plan to meet here each night for some straight talk about the coronavirus situation. I got to admit, I'm worried when I hear people talk about changing their behavior once we have a confirmed case in Colorado. Our medical expert, Dr. Pilot Coley, has said, we have to assume that the virus is here now. Whatever protective measures you plan to take once there is a confirmed case in Colorado, take them now. If you plan to replace handshakes with head nods or elbow bumps, do it now. Extra hand washing, now. Avoiding people who are sick, now. If you plan to cut down on unnecessary visits to crowded places to practice what they call social distancing, do it now. Don't wait for that first confirmed case in Colorado. Scientists say that acting early can help us flatten the curve to reduce the spread of the virus or at least delay its transmission so that the healthcare system can cope. If nothing else, acting now, based on facts, not fear, it'll help us to build healthy habits for that moment when the virus is here, which in all likelihood is now. One of Colorado's smallest counties is unwinding a pretty big elections mess here on primary day. It has the county elections clerk asking unaffiliated voters on the honor system. Which party primary ballot did you choose? A next viewer in Leadville tipped us off to the letters that went out from the Lake County clerk asking whether he had returned the Democratic or the Republican ballot. This is something that elections workers should know. Your ballot envelope tells them who is returning that ballot. But Lake County elections workers mistakenly took out 274 ballots, which have no trackable information, before they noted what was on the outside of the envelope. Clerk and recorder Patty Berger, who was herself unaffiliated, said that they were told by Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold's office to basically contact each voter and ask them on the honor system which party primary they picked. The Secretary of State's office acknowledged to us that that's less accurate. Voters only get one return envelope with the two ballots, and in Lake County, they're confident that election workers did reject five envelopes that came back with both ballots. 
Joe Mentum may not make it to Colorado this Super Tuesday. Former Vice President Joe Biden is surging as other moderates leave the race. But he never even came to campaign in Colorado, and he declined to take our questions when he flew in for a fundraiser. Senator Bernie Sanders is the presumptive favorite here. Though Biden is getting a boost in his goal of hitting 15 percent in Colorado to qualify for delegates, and that's because two of his last-minute endorsers, former rivals Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, they raced in letters to elections officials in Colorado asking that the votes for them not be counted. That means that votes for Buttigieg and Klobuchar essentially disappear. It will reduce the total number of votes counted, making it easier for Biden to reach 15%. We are getting some feedback tonight from next viewers asking if Colorado might improve its primary process. Specifically, people are talking about the idea of ranked choice voting. We talked about ranked choice voting after the Denver mayor's race last May. It's the idea that you would rank multiple candidates from your top choice to your last choice. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger takes a look. When you vote early in a presidential primary, when you vote early in a presidential primary, choosing a candidate who may not still be a candidate on election day is a possibility. The last thing that we want to do is to say, um, you know what, don't vote early. Democratic Senator Julie Gonzalez would like to see ranked choice voting. We demonstrated this method last year by asking you to rank your favorite next segment. The goal is to get one option to 50% plus one. After tabulating everyone's top choice, the most Colorado thing we've seen today was close, but not at the threshold. So we eliminated last place, you've crossed a line. For all the people who picked you've crossed a line as their first choice, we now count their second choice. You keep eliminating the last place option until you get a winner. Oh goodness, there would be a lot of logistics that we would need to work out in order to make this uh, a reality here in Colorado. There's a lot of people who, you know, feel very strongly about ranked choice. I'm not necessarily one of them, but I feel strongly that we need to find a solution. Democratic Representative Alec Garnett suggested on Twitter that primary voters be allowed to vote with a provisional ballot. Logistically, that's not possible since there's no way of tracking who you voted for, just that you voted. A provisional would essentially allow you to vote twice instead of replacing your vote. It made me feel uncomfortable as a state representative for people to reach out to me and say, how do I change my vote? And for me to reach out and say, Actually, the law says you have no option. It's an idea being considered by Colorado's Democratic Secretary of State, even before three more Democratic presidential candidates dropped out this weekend. My office established a committee to look at alternative voting methods, including ranked choice voting. Uh, we actually had our first meeting last month. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. Senator Bernie Sanders enters tonight's Super Tuesday tallies as the Democratic frontrunner and also the favorite to win Colorado's primary. President Trump's team thinks that a Sanders nomination would put Colorado in place. So let's discuss that with Joe Salazar, the Colorado co-chair for the Sanders campaign, and Christy Burton-Brown, who's the vice chair of the Colorado GOP. So Christy, first to you. The president's about 13 points underwater in terms of an approval rating in Colorado. How does he build a winning coalition here? Oh, I think he can absolutely build a winning coalition here in Colorado. There's many ways to do it. We have a lot of time between now and November. But one of the key things is focusing on the swing women vote. And I'm actually heading up Women in Action Coalition for the Republican Party. We're capturing the vote of suburban moms like myself and making the issues personal for them and what President Trump has done for our kids and our families. Joe, what do you think when you hear concerns that Sanders as the nominee is a gift to Republican Senator Cory Gardner? Well, I don't think Cory Gardner actually wants any part of Senator Sanders being the nominee. Senator Sanders is wildly popular here in the state of Colorado. He won the state of Colorado by 20% in 2016. He's going to win it tonight. He actually knows how to build coalitions. He doesn't go around offending Latinos or other communities of color or the LGBTQ community. It would be Cory Gardner's worst nightmare to have Senator Sanders as the, um, as the uh, uh, general election candidate for president. Let's talk about the Latino vote in Colorado, because uh, Team Trump thinks that they can make some inroads among some more conservative Latino voters. But that's been a strength of, of Bernie Sanders throughout the Democratic nomination process. Well, it's also been a strength of President Trump. If you look at 2016, it was one of the first times a Republican has ever won Pueblo County, for example, which has a very big Hispanic population. And President Trump carried that by a lot because it's working class people who care about their jobs. President Trump has delivered on that. And it's those kind of messages. And Sanders, unfortunately, he's done a lot of things that are really unpopular among Colorado voters, um, like trying to get rid of fracking entirely. He just has a single payer health care system. Colorado voters have overwhelmingly rejected that, including our Hispanic friends. Right now, Colorado's unemployment rate is the fifth lowest in the country. I want to talk about both that and the idea of single-payer health care when you guys join me tonight on 9 News at 9 o'clock. We have some more time to talk about these issues. But, but lastly to you, Joe, 
Senator Sanders, in a way, reminds me of President Trump in that there's a lot of folks who might not conventionally support him, but believe in his message particularly. If Bernie is not the Democratic nominee, do you think his support in Colorado transfers to Biden, Bloomberg, Warren? Absolutely. I think that the uh, individuals will go over to, uh, to whoever the nominee would be. Uh, just like we did in 2016, we made sure that Hillary Clinton won the state of Colorado, and it was a lot of center supporters who came over uh, to ensure that that happened. Joe Salazar, Christy Bird Brown, thank you both for your time. Look forward to having you with us on 9 News at 9 and 10 tonight. Thank you. As the Spanish flu ravaged the world in 1918, Gunnison shut out the outside. Are there lessons to be learned today? And an elected official in Colorado jokes about her political opponents getting coronavirus, then learns why you don't do that. Next. A century ago, the Spanish flu swept around the world, and Gunnison, Colorado, tried to keep it out. Researchers and our Steve Steger are looking closely at whether it worked. History certainly comes in handy in times like this. It was uh, a major, uh, major disaster. MSU Denver history professor Dr. Stephen Leonard learned something fascinating through his research of the 1918 Spanish flu in Colorado. It was a worldwide pandemic that uh, some people estimate killed up to as many as 50 or maybe even more million people worldwide. While that flu killed nearly 8,000 people in the state of Colorado back then. Told people that they couldn't enter, they advertised it widely. The town of Gunnison had next to no flu cases. It was well known that they didn't want people there. So sequestered, Gunnison has become a case study on preventing outbreaks. There were barricades and signs at the entry roads into the county saying basically drive through, do not stop or you'll get arrested. Dr. Alex Navarro the train, did the case study for the University of Michigan. He found the cancellation of public events, the mandated quarantines, and the literal barricades, they really did work. They basically closed the county uh, insofar as they could, and they more or less, it, it, it worked. During the first two waves of the flu, Gunnison saw only two cases, a woman who traveled to Chicago and her sister who picked her up at the train station. The helpful sister died. I think the lesson is that um, you know, Gunnison kind of got lucky. Both Navarro and Leonard say in today's world, that level of isolation may not be possible. But perhaps there is something we can take away. You're very wise to be prepared. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Denver City Councilwoman Candy Cedabaca is not backing down for cheering on a tweet that talked about spreading coronavirus at President Trump's rallies. Conservative media just came across Sudabaka's tweet from last Friday overnight. It pledges solidarity and laughs about a woman's suggestion that she would go to Trump rallies if she was diagnosed with COVID-19. The Colorado Republican Party is now calling on Sudabaka to resign. Sudabaka, who is a self-described Democratic Socialist, is not resigning and is not apologizing. Her team said the tweet was sarcastic and suggested that Republicans' energy would be better spent on improving the Trump administration's response to the coronavirus. March sunshine and 60s, and it's only going to get warmer from here. A nice shift from that stormy February. How about 60 degrees today? Above average, and that trend continues through the rest of the week. We're watching some high clouds rolling in and the potential for thunderstorms and flooding to the south. But with high pressure anchored over Colorado and the storm track to the north, southwest winds will bring in some warm air from the west, and that will see temperatures close to 70 come the weekend. Fair skies calm, quiet tonight are low at 30. Tomorrow, sunshine high 63. Again, the average. Average is 51. Keep that in mind as you look at these numbers. A weak front comes through Thursday. A little mountain snow, no advisories. And don't forget this weekend, daylight saving time. We spring ahead one hour. Set those clocks ahead Saturday night into Sunday morning. Tracking a storm and maybe a few rain showers early next week. But it was a beautiful day for a hike in Evergreen. Amy Reed Fegan with the shot today. Next, we'll sit down for a Super Tuesday conversation with two of my favorite political minds who know you can disagree without disliking. And if there's a sign that says no breakdancing in the elevator, there's probably a story behind it. And there is. Next. Let's bring in the Nine News political experts, Democrat James Mejia and Republican Kelly Maher, now to talk about Super Tuesday in Colorado. Joe Biden did not campaign here, didn't spend a lot of money here. 
but still might walk out of Colorado with a semi-successful result. What would success look like for the former vice president tonight in Colorado? He's not going to win the state. He just has to stay close. He has to stay relevant, stay in the conversation, make sure that he gets earned media, and people are still talking about his candidacy in other parts of the country. Yeah, I mean, early tonight, Biden is going to do well. If you look at the East Coast states is where he's going to do well. Mm -hmm. Colorado, I think he he wins if he gets on the board, quite frankly. He gets 15 percent. Yep. And I think and I think it's likely to happen, especially with Buttigieg and Klobuchar. Either of you guys see him outpacing Warren and taking second in Colorado tonight behind Bernie Sanders? Um, I think it's a possibility. I, mm -hmm. think, I think it's unlikely. He's been peaking late, but the issue with that is so many ballots were already cast. By the yeah. time Mayor Hancock endorsed him, you were looking at 600,000 Democrat ballots already cast. Even if you take Klobuchar and Buttigieg's off the table, still, I don't know. It, it, it occurs to me that in this, our first presidential primary in Colorado in 20 years, we're going to have a really skewed idea of the turnout. We know that it's enormous in the open primary, but yet all those Klobuchar and Buttigieg votes are going to kind of disappear appear. So that's one thing to keep in mind for tonight. Let's talk about Mike Bloomberg. I, I don't know that anybody expects him to do particularly well in Colorado tonight, even with the absence of polling. He came in, spent a lot of money on this TV station and others, hired a lot of staff. Gorgeous office used to be the Patagonia store, I think. Um, what do we make of his impact in Colorado and around the country? I mean, ultimately, he's right now essentially campaigning for Bernie Sanders. He is committed to keep all of his staff through November, and he said that he's committed them to defeat Donald Trump. I think he's setting himself up for a third-party run, and that's the way to reelect Donald Trump. That's an interesting idea. I don't think there's any way his staff would stay on board for an idea like that. It, Bloomberg's role is going, going to be a spoiler. The question is, whose day is he going to ruin with all that money? And, and uh, blanketing the airwaves, who's that going to hurt and how long does he stay in the race? We, we've got just a few seconds remaining. Is it possible that Elizabeth Warren's bright spot tonight is in Colorado? I mean, there's a chance that she could be competitive with Sanders here. Potentially, but that will be her only bright spot, it looks like, at this point. She's going to have real trouble even in her home area of the New England. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then in the New England area, she's not even looking looking good there. Yeah. She's going to have to really reassess. Yeah, and by as, bright spot, I mean not win, but lose by less than yeah. everywhere else. Warren is more popular outside her home than inside, yeah. very much like myself. We return with a sign that if the elevator says no break dancing, that is probably because of a very specific incident. It's a sign that busting a move can bust an elevator. Our viewer Stuart sent us a photo of the sign warning against breakdancing in the elevator at the McNichols building in Denver. It says, no, really, trust us, we have stories. All right, well, let's hear them. McNichols was built in 1910, so the stuff inside of it's pretty old, occasionally malfunctions. At one point, somebody really did breakdance in the elevator and busted it in the process. A lot of feedback tonight about Denver City Councilwoman Candy Cedabaca's tweet laughing about the idea of spreading coronavirus at a Trump rally. Christy says jokes, disease, and politics don't mix. Tracy says it's a joke. Good grief. Why do we have to be so outraged and offended at everything? And then there's what Sandy wrote to us tonight. She, Candy Cedabaca, should rise above juvenile actions and so should others. Unfortunately, we can't control the president's words or tweets, but we don't have to engage him. Hope that you will join us for our continuing Super Tuesday coverage tonight and at 9 and 10.